Welcome into Tapping Vegas, brought to you by Better and Green. We are back with another card, breaking down UFC Edmonton. The Oilers suck, so we need to throw some other guys in there to fight. So we have Brandon Moreno versus Amir Albazi. This is a pretty good card. Um, sometimes, you know, you got to get out of the apex, throw something together. Bobby, we don't normally do this, but we had a pretty good week last week, so I'm going to throw it to you for a quick recap. Yeah, so we had Hamza Chmaya by sub that we hit on. Nobody except us thought that he would make Robert Whitaker look that easy as fast as he did. And we also had Ilya Taporia, KOTKO, the first guy to really finally crack Max's chin. Nobody was thinking that was going to happen either. A lot of people didn't even think he had a chance against Max Holloway, but guess what? We did. So very profitable and very uh, vindicating to be uh, – capitalizing on things like that along with i also remember the shar megamed uh megamed mm -hmm. sherpov uh shar megamedov excuse me not megamed sherpov geez he's dagestanis the shar megamedov <laughs> uh, kotko that we hit on so pretty and you're missing one you're missing one too we hit the murphy decision straight Dude, up so good so Times good two. we're just missing stuff that's how good we are <laughs> imagine if you would have turned that into a parlay <sighs> actually Lousy. bobby you know what I did. What? Wow. I we did. got it all covered. <laughs> I did. We I did turn it into a parlay. We did, man. I did it over on my bet stamp. You guys can follow me over there if you want to. For the American Betting League, Bobby, I did it. I did a three-leg parlay. I did Ilya, I did Leron, and I did Shara. Now imagine if you would have added Hamzat and done a four-legger. I know. Every single last one on that four-legger would have hit. But, hey, we give two-leggers, three-leggers, four-leggers, we just don't give you the whole damn horse, but we give you the show cow. <laughs> yeah, see, in this league, you're capped at three. Imagine if I could do more. Uh, I do think I made a little bit of money on Chemayev. I was on Whitaker, so I did throw some money on him. Um, just, you know, hoping to get paid out on the big plus odds, but I'm right. glad I didn't go all in on him, and I listened to you a little bit too. I think I did had another, like, a two-leg parlay, like Chemayev and the under, which – that hit easy so <laughs> i told you dude it worked out you're welcome fisher rock guy you know <laughs> who you are <laughs> i'm excited to break down these fights man you want to just jump right into it let's do it man all right man first fight we're going to talk about is garrett armfield versus serhi city right now i'm seeing 30 percent of the bets and money is on armfield he was beating high stand until he got caught um there at the end in the third I, I like Armfield. I liked Armfield in that fight, and it didn't turn out. But, you know, he was going the right direction. Right now, it's the Vegas side. He's only plus 124. We're seeing 30% bets of money, like I said. So not a lot of people are picking him after that loss. There's not a lot of money coming in on him. So I think this is a good opportunity for Armfield to get back in the win column and for Vegas to make some money. So don't be one of those people throwing it on the other side. What do you think, Bobby? Yeah, I like Armfield in this fight. I think it gives him a good opportunity to rebound, especially when you can get uh, Armfield right now, <coughs> excuse me, at a plus 124, today minus 148. Armfield looks like a pretty good bet here. Armfield, I like how he, in his last fight, was able to do really well defending on uh, the takedowns and uh, being able to just really neutralize that game plan of a uh, high stand until a high stand just caught him. Because uh, he's shown before, it was actually the Katona fight that I was thinking of where he did a really yeah. good job defending on the takedowns. That's the fight I was thinking of, excuse me, not the high stand. So he's shown he can do it because Brad Katona is that guy that just wants to wrestle you. He just wants to close the distance and engage with you, try to get you down. And he handily just dismantled Brad Katona. Garrett Armfield did over uh, three rounds, cruising to a unanimous decision victory back uh, January of this year. Yeah, unfortunately got caught in round three, lost to high stand. Who knows how that could have happened had he not been finished. Not sure what the scorecards we're looking at. So, yeah, Armfield just definitely has an opportunity to uh, set himself up for success. He's still very young in his UFC career, had a lot of canceled fights. One, two, three, four. This would be his fifth fight. Still a lot of room to grow. A lot of opportunity to be had here uh, for Garrett Armfield, and especially when he's going up against uh, – Sir Hayes today, who is a uh, second UFC fight, already lost his debut, split decision over three rounds to Ramon Tavares back January of this year also. So both guys both fall on that January card. So let's see if Sadeh can, you know, overcome that uh, that issue because Rome, 
Funny enough, Ramon Tavares was also the guy he got his contender series contract off of with a round one punch <laughs> win. September 2023 rematches him in his UFC debut January of this year and loses. So right. very ironic that he faced his guy twice in a row, once to get in the UFC and once in his UFC debut and then uh, lost. So very interesting, fun fact there. So, yeah, Armfield, let's see what he can do. Let's see if today can overcome that kind of confidence crusher of losing his debut and uh, let's roll with Armfield money line. Love it. Money line. Don't need to take any methods here. Uh, why don't you take this next fight, Bobby? I already know what side you're going to be on because it involves one of your boys. Jack Shore versus Yusuf Zalal. Not a big Yusuf Zalal fan. Just kind of think that for as long as he's been in the UFC, he just really has not made the impact you expect a guy as touted as he was coming in to uh, to make, which is why he was cut uh, with from the UFC. And this is his second run. So he made his debut. Uh, with a splash, February 2020, unanimous decision over Lingo, Austin Lingo, unanimous over Jordan Griffith in June, August of that year, Peter Barrett. So really just rolling through uh, COVID. Lost to Ilya Taporia, October 2020, no shame there. Is a little bit of shame in losing to Sung Woi Choi, February of 2021. No shame in losing to Sean Woodson in 2021, but you get it. Majority decision barely eked out over Blackshear. Then he got cut because at that point he would have been in the UFC with three wins, three losses, and a majority decision. So, yeah, they cut him. He went to the regionals, hung out around, and Sparta was the organization he went to, Sparta Fighting Championship. Did some kickboxing, did a boxing match, had another MMA fight, came back March of this year to the UFC, choked out Billy Quarantillo, very impressive. Jarno Aarons, not so much. August of this year, so he's looking to stay hot with a two finish streak, both by rear naked over Billy in round two over Jarno in round one. Now he meets Jack Shore. This is where I think things change for him. So Jack Shore is a guy I've been high on for a while. Kind of had my eyes on him following his career, following his trajectory. Fortunately, since he's been in the UFC, since he made his debut all the way back in 2019, he went on a good streak and then finally had his first loss two years ago, 2022, arm triangle to Ricky Simone, and then lost to Joe Anderson Brito by Dr. Stoppage this past May. So in between, he's had some wins. So, yeah, coming off that Dr. Stoppage, I, I really thought that Brito fight, I believe we covered that. thought that was a fight uh, Shore would be able to win. He was not in round two, got pretty much dismantled in the striking exchanges. Uh yeah, just, just usually going off of what I know about Jack Shore, just kind of being a grappling guy, kind of having some good uh, submissions and everything there. I'm thinking Jack Shore would definitely be wise to avoid standing with Yusuf Zalal. Yusuf Zalal is primarily a guy who's just going to pitter-patter at you. He's just going to angle around. He's just going to chew some shots. He's just going to try to take his chance on uh, you making a stupid mistake and him trying to counter you, just easily cruise to a decision style of fighting. Uh, could the rear nakeds indicate a change in his fighting style? Maybe, since he does have two since he's been back in the UFC, back-to-back -back like that. Maybe it could indicate he's trying something different, or maybe he just felt he had the advantage over those particular individuals in the grappling department. But I'm here to tell you right now, if he feels that way over Jack Shore, I think he is underestimating Jack Shore significantly. So Jack Shore's keys to winning this. Uh, keep striking exchanges limited. Uh, just use them to safely enter in and transition to the grappling. Try to hold Yusuf Zalal down. Look for a sub. Keep position over submission, though. Don't chase the sub and just basically wet blanket them and just ride them out to an easy unanimous decision win. Easier said than done, obviously. He can get called on the way in. Obviously, every fight and every round starts standing. But I think Jack Shore should be able to do this as long as he has a smart, educated game plan. He neutralizes the forward pressure of Yusuf Zalal, takes away those kicks and punches and just him kind of spinning around like a tornado and all that jazz and just makes this a grindy wrestling grappling match. And just I think that's going to quickly show Yusuf Zalal is not coming back into the UFC as some type of grappling phenom. He's just been taking advantage of some uh, gaps he feels he's identified in his opponent's skill set. So... This should be Jack Shore, especially with the um, with the odds being what they are now. Uses is all. I don't feel like it should be a minus two forty five right now. 
especially when Jack Shore's only lost twice in the whole entire time he's been in the UFC since 2019, once to Ricky Simone, which is pretty understandable, and Joe Anderson Brito's nothing to sneeze at. Yusuf Zalal just shouldn't be this heavy of a favorite. So Jack Shore money line, so I'm rolling on this to be safe. What do you think? I think you need to be a little careful with your wording because you said you had your eyes on Jack Shore and our comment section is erotic enough already. So uh, no, I'm just going to throw a flag on you there, Bobby. <laughs> but um, I'm on the same side as you, though. I'm also on Jack Shore here. Uh, I'm going to – you went at it from the fight angle. I'm going to go at it from the Vegas angle. That's kind of where we uh, – thunder and lightning, where we make each other better. Jack Shore right now, 3% of the money, 12% of bets. You're paying out plus 200, so Vegas is going to pay out, what, 6% of the money of this pot? They're happy to eat that 94%. They they have no care in the world. They're on Jack Shore, too. So I think, you know what, I, like you said, I feel like Jack Shore shouldn't be uh, like a 2-1 to one underdog. So, yeah, let's hop in on him, hop in on the side of Vegas, and let's go, man. All right, Bobby, this next fight, man, Derek Lewis versus Janata Denise. It raises one question that I think is really fair. It's the heavyweight division. Uh, anybody can be knocked out at any time. The level of competition isn't the highest. So the one question for Derek Lewis is, are his balls going to get too hot? But there's one thing I couldn't beat, an embarrassing condition called my balls was hot. I say no. I say no. I think Derek Lewis can be fine. Plus 150. He's an underdog. I, I was watching the Janata Denise like some highlights, some fights. I'm just not impressed with him, man. His striking defense is terrible. Derek Lewis is, is terrible too. So I'm not saying that, you know, Denise is, is so, so much worse, but we've seen uh, Derek get it done so much more. I believe that Janata is three fights into his UFC career. You might need to fact check me there. That's just off the top of my head. Um, I, I'm not super impressed with him, man. I'm just really not. He looks really slow to me. I'm not seeing that explosive power of the guys that he has knocked out. Okay. Not. We saw the Robels to Spain when he came in and it was just on a tear. And now, now what? He's like a decision guy or losing. Like his hype just completely fell off a cliff. I'm not seeing it with Denise. Right now, money and bets are pretty much 50-50. So I'm going to take the underdog here. And I just think this might be a dog card. Yeah, you were asking, fact check, is this going to be Denise's third UFC fight? You're absolutely correct. He only has two fights in the UFC. Austin Lane, who we just saw lose very recently, the Texans, I don't even know if he was a running back, O-lineman, whatever he was that got cut. Knocked him out with a left hook in round two. You know, missed decision over Carl Williams. That's it. That's all. That's all she wrote, folks. So, Janata Denise and Derek Lewis, yeah. Somebody's asleep at the wheel on this because Derek Lewis, at 40 years of age, with, uh, you know, all the wear and tear he has on his body and all the fights he's been through and whatnot, still makes his biggest uh, – makes his biggest paychecks off exact matchups like this. Everybody counting mm -hmm. him out, thinking, okay, he's 39, he'll be 40 this February, excuse me. But everybody thinking, okay, Derek Lewis, we're going to feed some up-and-coming guy to him, and he's going to make a name off Derek Lewis, and Derek Lewis is just going to ride off into the sunset. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It worked for Sergey Spivak, but ask Marco Sergio de Lima how well that worked out. It worked for Jelton Almeida, but ask Rodrigo Nasamonto how well that worked out, you know? Ask right. Chris Dawkins how well that worked out. So every time Derek Lewis comes up against, like, these young, surging guys in the division, yeah, sometimes he loses like he did to Cyril Gaon, and then sometimes mm -hmm. he absolutely destroys them like he did Nasamonto, like he did Rogerio de Lima, like he did Chris Dawkins, like he did – Alexei, uh, not Alexei Olenek, there was somebody else that was pretty young when he fought him and he just absolutely destroyed him. Ty Burra at the time they fought in 2018 was young. Uh, <clears throat> Gabriel Gonzaga was one of those guys. Victor Pesta at the time they fought was one of those guys. All those guys try to make a name off Derek Lewis. More often than not, Derek Lewis has just added them to his impressive resume as the man with the most knockouts in UFC history. And each time he just keeps breaking his own record off guys like Janad Denise and you know, how much do you hate this guy to give him his third UFC fight against knockout artist Derek Lewis? That just seems <laughs> criminally malpracticed right there. So nothing more to really say about this. 
Obviously, Denise can win just like all the guys I mentioned who did win, did win against Eric Lewis. There obviously is a path there. But when you're giving a guy with his third UFC fight experience and you're putting him across the cage from Derek Lewis and you think Derek Lewis is going to fold before this guy, once again, I get the concerns about Derek Lewis. I get even asking if his heart's still in it based off some of the fights he's had before. But I'm taking Derek Lewis every time, especially at a plus 142. And if they're stupid enough to let a KO, TKO get too crazy on plus money, I'd be curious to see what that's looking at, too, because I'd easily take that in two shakes of a lamb's tail. <laughs> I I love your analysis, Bobby. Uh, He doesn't play for the Jets, so I'm not going to say there's absolutely no chance his heart's not in it because, holy hell, I don't think I've seen a team with more stars look this bad. Um, Sorry to bring football into it. If you guys like football, watch Intentional Lounge. We'll try to keep this MMA-related. I just had to throw in a Jets reference there. Uh, Right now, Bobby, the under... The line is at a one and a half, so not surprising. You know, you usually have that two and a half line for these type of fights and not the um, main event. So, right here, you're getting the one and a half heavyweight line minus 140 for the under one and a half. So, they're thinking this knockout. Uh, Denise coming off a decision win. He could knock Lewis out. And, you know, we're just sitting here with egg on our face, but I don't know. It feels like it's Lewis. When I. Actually, was writing these down about 30 minutes ago, Bobby. It was plus 150 for Lewis. It's already moved eight cents. This up, it's plus 142 now. And I was finishing when right before we recorded. So like, Good. let's see, 15 minutes ago, and it's already moved eight cents. So that means that money's starting to pour in on Derek Lewis. Oh, that's actually bad because we want to keep him as the dog. So you're gonna want to hurry up and uh, <laughs> take advantage of this while you can. Bobby, why don't you take the next fight away, man? Aaron Blanchfield versus Rose Namajunas. This is another fight. Classic error of just uh, going off, okay, what what just happened most recently? Oh, okay, what's the most recent fight? The most recent fight, Aaron Blanchfield lost to Manon Firo. So since she lost to Manon Firo, then obviously she's done. She's washed and all this. And it's like they both were, you know, they both had only lost one fight in their whole pro career when they were matched up against each other draws are so rare somebody had to lose and so how this is playing into the analysis is this rose nama Yunus. we know what rose nama Yunus is right now regardless of whether she's at flyweight now which this fight is at flyweight how she was at straw weight etc rose nama Yunus, around the time she gained uh, the championship from joanna and jay check in the first fight has been this bouncy in and out point fighter who just will pick you apart and overwhelm you with significant strikes and just be elusive and angle out and you just won't catch her. So that has served her very well throughout her tenure since she first kind of came on the scene and started embracing that fight style because that was an example of a positive change and transformation she made in her career from the ultimate fighter. When she started her pro fighting career for the UFC on the ultimate fighter in 2014, she got submitted by Carla Esparza. Uh, you've heard her name many times on this show. And if you're a UFC fan or an MMA fan in general, you definitely know Carla Esparza. You know, she's an aggressive wrestler and an aggressive grappler. And she is good at subbing people. Rose Namajunas back then in 2014, 2015, was also good at submitting people. That's how she submitted Angela Hill. That's how she submitted Paige Van Zamp. That's how she has done women like early on in her career for a very long time until 2017. Like she submitted Michelle Waterson Gomez. Uh, then she finally got the towel shy against Shin Jacek, and it was a KO TKO in the rematch she won by decision. And then ever since then, around 2019, she hasn't really been doing that grappling anymore because Jessica Andrade slammed her on her head. That might have played a role in it in 2019 when that happened. 2020, she rematched Andrade, and she almost lost in the in the final rounds because Andrade is just a very powerful puncher. So how does that tie into this conversation? Rose Namajunas and her evolution has taken her and her early career on the Ultimate Fighter from a grappler who would look for opportunistic submissions and would try to take you down, or if you find yourself on the mat with her, would snatch up a submission. She primarily considered herself a BJJ fighter. Uh, over time, she evolved around the NJCheck fight. She, by the time she faced NJCheck, she became this in-and-out fighter that I just discussed with angles and movement and footwork and boxing and all this. 
So once her fight with Andrade happened, who knows how that transformed her uh, ability to grapple. But I would think that it made her even more uh, confident with the decision to not try to grapple because Andrade slammed her on her head off a high crotch takedown attempt. So how does that tie into this fight? Aaron Blanchfield is a grappler. Yes, she was not able to take down Manon Firo in their last fight, and that is part of the reason why she lost a unanimous decision to Firo because she was not able to implement her grappling heavy game plan that she clearly had invested a lot of time, effort, and energy into. But here's my counter to that. I don't have bench press numbers, squat, deadlift numbers, all that. I'm going off the eye test. I'm going off of what I see based off explosive movements, tenacity, grappling engagements, all those things. And I will say this, Rose Namajunas does not look like she will be as strong as Manon Furo. Going back again, based off of Rose Namajunas and her prior game plans and her prior history, what does Rose Namajunas traditionally struggle with? She struggles with women who are bigger than her, more physically stronger than her, more physically in your face and aggressive, aggressive grapplers, aggressive heavy punchers, like Jessica Andrade is the reason why she almost lost to Jessica Andrade a second time in those final rounds because her volume couldn't keep up with the pace. Uh, her volume and pace, excuse me, couldn't keep up with Jessica Andrade slugging, thudding power. It's like, okay, you'll get shot with a 22 six times and you might survive that 22. You'll be busted up and you'll be damaged, a la Rose Nama Yunus. But if you get hit one time with a strong magnum slug coming out of a shotgun, you're probably dead. That is Jessica Andrash. To tie that into this fight, once again, don't have the numbers, but I'm thinking Aaron Blanchfield is a physically stronger woman, a harder puncher, and her best avenue to try to win this fight against Rose Nama Yunus is to make Rose Nama Yunus uncomfortable in those grappling exchanges. Could Rose Nami Yunus go back to her roots and remember in 2014 and 2015 she used to sub girls? Sure, she could remember that. But I think most likely what's going to happen if Aaron Blanchfield tries to be smart with a grappling heavy game plan is she's going to wet blanket Rose Nami Yunus. She's going to be able to take her down. She's going to be able to control her. And Rose Nami Yunus' whole meta at that point, based off what it looks like her fight style has been for the majority of her career, is going to tell her that she either needs to get back to her feet by either using the cage or if she's open mat, trying to work her way to the feet or use the cage to her advantage to get up and to try to circle off and to try to make it a striking engagement again. I think she's going to be physically overpowered and unable to do that. If she finds herself up against the cage, she's going to get lifted up like Andrade lifted her up. I don't think it's the fight's going to end with her getting slammed on her head again, but she's definitely going to get mat return, and she's going to find herself in that same position again, this time demoralized and defeated and a little bit more tired that she was not able to get back up to her feet. And then Blanchfield's just going to control it. Her best avenue is to not allow Blanchfield to get any type of takedowns, to try to use that superior movement, to try to use that superior footwork, angle off all those things and just not get caught. Problem is she has to do that for 25 minutes in a five. Uh, actually, this isn't the main event, right? This is 15 minutes. So this is three rounds. I believe so. Changes it a little bit, but my point still remains the same. I still think uh, that. Oh, no, I apologize, Bobby. It is four and a half. Oh, so it's a five round fight. Yeah. Four and a half line. So five round fight. Okay. So if it's a five round fight, this makes it, this makes it even more that I'm on Blanchfield because Blanchfield just needs one takedown attempt. Nami Yunus has to be perfect the entire time. She cannot let herself get taken down even once because I firmly believe if she's taken down even once, she's not getting back up there for she's losing. The MMA no longer is revolving around a meta of if you're a BJJ player and you get stuck on your back, oh, you, can, you don't have to worry because you can sweep, you can submit – or you can get back to your feet. That's not happening in MMA anymore, especially the submission part. It doesn't matter. You don't get points for sub attempts. You only get points and you only win if you actually lock up a sub. So every bit of time you know, she is on her back with no sense of urgency to sweep, no sense of um, urgency to improve her position, to try to do anything like that, she's losing the fight and she'll easily lose a five-round uh, fight by decision just that quick. So she's going to have to stay elusive. She's going to have to stay fast and do all these things that she has been really great at doing in her career. But at this point in her career with the wear and tear and the age and the miles and everything that she's been through, who has it more, you know? Who has it more, Aaron Blanchfield or Rose Namajunas? 
at the odds I'm getting her at, I think Blanchfield has it more because Blanchfield's a minus 130, Namias is a plus 110. I feel like this is too good of odds to get Blanchfield at because I firmly believe Blanchfield should be a pretty heavy favorite, and the only reason why she's not is because people have recency bias over the Furo fight. Obviously, once again, Rose Namajunas, every fight starts standing, as I said about Jack Shore and Yusuf Zalal. Every round starts standing. You have to have the impetus to go out there and get the opponent to the mat and keep them there. But if Rose Namajunas can't do that, and if she slows down and all those quick reflex and attributes that definitely don't get better with age and wear and tear start to fail her, I just find it hard to believe that Blanchfield's going to be intimidated enough by Nami Yunus's grappling to not want to take her down. Plus, in a purely submission-based grappling match, uh, Jillian Robertson was able two years ago in December, I believe it was, to handily choke out Rose Nami Yunus very fast. Jillian Robertson is not as big and as strong as Aaron Blanchfield, so I'm not trying to do MMA math here, but in a purely submission-based grappling match, Rose Nami Yunus didn't even have a chance against Jillian Robertson. Obviously, MMA and everything starting standing adds a whole new issue to that and a whole new frame of reference and skill set and et cetera, et cetera. But it's just, once again, she has to be perfect for five minutes over 25 minutes each and every round because all it takes is that one takedown. And once she Blanchfield gets that one takedown, I feel like the round is secure because it's just going to be so hard for Nami Yunus to get up. And now she can just lay on her controller, just get her more tired. The more tired you get, your footwork certainly doesn't improve with fatigue. Your punches certainly don't get more accurate with fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. So what she lacks for in the striking department, I don't know if she's necessarily powerful with her strikes, but it in, could end up benefiting her anyway because that's another thing Nami uh, struggles with. As long as Blanchfield has some power, just like the Andrade fights, doesn't really matter if Nami Yunus is landing 20 to 6, if those 6 are, like I said, shotgun slugs coming at you compared to, like, 22 rounds coming at you. I like it, man. I, I like your analysis. I tried to look up those uh, like weightlifting r- records and scores for you. Uh, Rose Nami Yunus is the only one. I couldn't find anything on Blanchfield. Rose deadlift PR is 245 pounds. I don't know what Blanchfield lifts, but I know it's more than that. It's got to I mean, be, She's right? got three trunks for legs, right? Got to be. Yeah, it has to be. So I was on Nami Yunus here. I... I think you switched me. I think I will go to Blanchfield. Money's starting to come in on Rose. Uh, Looks like before she had 40% of the money and 58% of the bets. So you know what? This might get more public and more money poured into the pot of Rose. So you know what? I like this. This might be close to a pick by the time we get to fight night. So we're seeing sharp money on Blanchfield. So I'm guessing just the public money is pouring in on Rose. Cause I know, you know, she's a champion. The name's familiar. I know Aaron Blanchfield is kind of like the younger hype prospect, but I initially picked Blanchfield or picked against Blanchfield to pick Nami Yunus. Cause like you said, that last fight against Manon, I, it just left such a sour taste in my mouth. I thought she was so much better than Manon. I didn't think there was a chance in hell that she wouldn't win it. I, I'm pretty sure I probably even said like a sub. I thought she was going to finish it. And so for her just to flat out not win, I think I was still pissed about it. And I'm glad that you were able to give me the analysis I needed to kind of like take a step back, take a breath, and be like, okay, just because like it bit me once doesn't mean I need to act out and just bet the other side here. So you're right. Aaron Blanchfield, if she can get this fight to the ground, you know, it, this might be a long night for Rose. And maybe we'll see a Blanchfield finish. I don't think either of us are going to pick a method here, right? I think just taking the money line because women's been making me too unpredictable. And it's just like, this could easily go to a decision. So just money line for me, money line for you. I'm not confident enough because I could easily see a world where Rose Nami Yunus just cruises to unanimous decision with that pitter-patter accuracy and everything. And, right. uh, you know, no disrespect to Rose. Shout out to No Juice Nami Yunus, her brother. Cool dude I'm friends with on Twitter and whatnot. But I could easily see it going either way, so I don't feel that confident making a specific prop pick. But, I mean, yeah, overall, like I said, yeah, it sucks. I was pretty upset about the Fiero loss that Blanchfield suffered too, but – once again, somebody had to lose. Somebody had to get that second loss on their record. You know, two young, up-and-coming, fierce uh, 
fierce competitors in the division. Somebody's got to lose. And, uh, you know, Fiero, like I said, I just feel like she's stronger. So, obviously, she didn't have as much difficulty defending those takedowns. But I feel like Rose is really going to have some trouble. She's not going to be able to – she's not going to have the strength and the tenacity and those other physical attributes that Fiero has to be able to do that. So, Yeah. Yeah, I, I liked um, Blanchfield a lot more against uh, Manon. But, you know, I'll take her again here. I'll take her again here. Guys – if you spend $5 over at our friends DraftKings, they will give you guys $200 of bonus bets. And each week, I'm going to try to give you one extra play. This is not Bobby's Haymaker. This is completely different. This is my DraftKings play of the card. Mark andre Barreau, last time they were in Canada, he just flat out lost. And this is a guy I think, you know what, he's... He's pretty talented. I wouldn't say he's, like, one of the best guys out there. I wouldn't say he's even, like, top 15 or a contender guy. But he's a guy that's that, that's decent. He can you can throw him on a card and people will watch. Right now you can get the under two and a half rounds at plus 100. I think with this being in Edmonton, Marc-Andre Barreau, I think he gets this win. I think that he gets done in front of the home crowd. I think he gets a finish here. So give me that under two and a half at plus 100 over at DraftKings. Go to our friends over there. Five bucks gets you two hundred dollars in bonus bets, and if you do the five bucks and you win, ten bucks back, baby. Ten bucks. Your original five, and you get five more. Uh, Bobby, you ready for the main fight? Yeah, let's go. All right, man. Let's talk about Brandon Moreno facing Amir Albazi. Right now, Moreno is coming off a uninspiring loss to Roy Val. I believe I was on Roy Val in that fight, but man. Moreno looked just so – I don't know what the word is. He looked like the New York Jets. <laughs> I'm just going to keep piling on them uh, this, <laughs> this week's episode. He just had no heart, man. He just seemed like he was there, and I believe this was the fight night in Mexico City, if I'm not wrong. Once again, could be wrong. This is just off the top of my head. I feel like I have to mention that now every time I say anything uh, that doesn't pertain to this exact card. But Brandon Moreno, he was just so uninspiring, man. He just went out there, thought he would get the win against Roy Val, and he didn't. And I hope, and I think that's going to light a fire under his butt. Brandon Moreno is one of the best guys in this division. He has not shown it lately, especially that last fight. I'm going to pick him here. I'm going to pick him here. Minus 175 is what I had him at the start of this show. I just think he gets it done here. I, I'm not a big believer in Amir Abazi. I think Moreno has faced way better competition. I mean, he's faced the Roy Vals, the Pantojas. Moreno's been champion. I think he gets back on the right track here. What do you think, Bobby? So, yeah, it was Brandon Roy Val that Moreno fought. You're correct about that. February of this year, uh, they faced each other. And it was uh, UFC Fight Night. It was UFC Fight Night. You said Mexico City. Was that what you said? Yeah, I think so. Yes, you were correct. So that was Mexico City as they fought each other. So, yeah. Coming off the Roy Val loss. Coming off the Pantoja loss. Other than that, beat Davis and Figueredo. Kai Carr, France. Pretty much a who's who of the division, right? Well, as we saw last week, it doesn't matter your accolades, it doesn't matter your veteran level, it doesn't matter your experience, who you beat in the past. Sometimes it's just that young up-and-coming guy's time. And that's kind of what I'm leaning towards with this. 31 years old, 17-1 uh, and one professional record, very inactive. Going through his topology, made his debut July 2020 in the UFC, triangle choke win, two canceled fights, didn't fight again until 2021, unanimous decision, another two canceled fights. Didn't fight again until 2022, rear naked over Francisco Figueredo. Another two canceled fights. Didn't fight again until December. Strikes finish over Alessandro Costa. Split decision win uh, last year over Kai Carr France. Another canceled fight. And now he's finally fighting Brandon Moreno. So pretty much the only thing that's held back Amir al is just canceled fights. <coughs> so with that being said, on fights like this where the odds are – so out of balance in favor of the older guy with the more wear and tear and blah, 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 blah. I like mystery boxes in this case. Uh, I just like the idea of a mystery box, especially when I can get Albazi money line at plus 145, Moreno minus 175. This could easily be a situation kind of like what I was talking about with Blanchfield and uh, Rose Namajunas. 
where it should be flipped and we should see Moreno as like more like a minus 300 or something just crazy like that because of how easy he just goes out there and stomps out Albazi. In the meantime, to try to be profitable and to try to make some money, I'll, I'll lean towards Albazi just because there's so much there that we don't know. What we have seen has been really good, so we have reason to hope, but what we haven't seen could be potentially what ends up derailing his whole career and, you know, kind of answers the question of why haven't we seen more of this guy? Well, here's why, because once he actually gets that first shot at competition and he goes up against, you know, the Brandon Moreno's of the world, he kind of folds. So actually, you know what? I've talked myself out of it as I, as I've started to make this analysis. So I'm going Brandon Moreno, I'm going Brandon Moreno, because there's just too much that we don't know about Albazi. I'm actually going to flip that into a negative. It's just, I don't like the fact that he's fought the guys that we can barely name and like his, what, fifth UFC fight or whatever the hell this is. He's going up against Brandon Moreno. Once again, maybe it's a Hamzat situation where, I mean, Kakaoa France is a really good one to get I heard that. A lot of people him. argue that he didn't win that one, though. Well, it was split, so I could see yeah. why. I didn't watch that fight myself, so. Yeah, I'm going Brandon Moreno. I'm going to take that same argument, and I'm just going to take the different road with it and use it as a negative. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Albazi's too too shaky right there to build a house on. That foundation's a little sketchy. Dude, you're so, you're so convincing this week. You turned me and yourself. I know, man. I know. <laughs> That's pretty good, man. How about your haymaker this week? We I had, like I said earlier, we had a film early, so we don't have method odds. But, Bobby, uh, throw us some method out there, and then I will have it up on the graphic, which is just even more reason for you guys to make sure you're following us on socials, on X, on Instagram, on Facebook, on everything. Follow us there so you guys get more than what we just post over here on YouTube. So what are you thinking, Bobby? With how drunk the chef in the kitchen is in Vegas with the Derek Lewis money line, I'm really tempted to know what that KOTKO line is because if they're too drunk to taste that chicken, they don't know what they're cooking. And just like Russ Wilson, maybe they need to be kicked out of that kitchen. So <laughs> I'm going to go with whatever Derek Lewis, if that KOTKO is anywhere sniffing that plus money line, I'm all over that. Oh, man. He's already at plus 150. Derek, let's be honest, Derek Lewis KO is probably plus 160. <laughs> I would him. No, it's you probably it's probably problem. more like plus two hundred, plus three hundred is what I'm gonna guess. Oh baby, I hope so. I hope yeah. so because that would be rub hands like bird man. That feels free, dude. That yeah. we we shot high last week with the eighteen hundred. Let's reel it in a little bit. This one seems very, very reasonable. Uh yeah, let's do it, man. Let's make some more money this weekend. Great weekend last weekend. Uh actually pretty nice cards coming up. Like we're going to end the year with some decent UFC. So I'm excited to break down the card next week with you, Bobby. Besides that, we'll see you guys then. Peace guys. Peace. You better start listening to the better in green podcast. You will not regret it. Trust me, trust me, trust me. And Hey, I'm Dean Blandino. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Better Win Green, eh? To Better Win Green, eh? To Better Win Green, eh? Listen in and cash out. That's what it's all about. Come on, let's make cash now. We always on spot and we cover old spot from the bottom to the top, eh? Shout out to Ethan, shout out to Wyatt, shout out to Ben. Welcome, welcome to our podcast. Better Win Green.